right. Hey, if you didn't get one of these last week, I want to encourage you to grab one on your way out. They're just outside the door. This is about our, our current series, which is called the Kingdom Builder Series. But I got to point something out because I missed last week. I didn't see this. But our annual goal to give to missions is $900,000. Uh, we have given $583,000 this year. Is that awesome or what? That's amazing. So we, uh, every year we take up a year in offering for missions for all the stuff we're doing globally and locally uh, outside the walls of our church. And our goal is $317,000 before the year is over. And I can't do it all by myself. So we're in a series of messages about this topic. And um, uh, this is a, a good place to start, I think. Where do you get your financial advice? Like when you, when you have a financial question about investment, budgeting, stuff like that, where, you know, where do you go? Um, one possibility is your broke friend who owns a G-Wagon but can't afford groceries. Okay, uh, anybody got a friend like that? Okay, they can't afford groceries to put in the other G-Wagon, the grocery cart. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't recommend that. Um, another option would be your financial advisor who tells you to invest as much as you can, find all the tax shelters that you can. So as your money grows, this is the subtext, his or her fees will grow as well. Okay? So I'm just pointing out the fact that uh, I'm not against financial advisors. We've got a few in the room. I just want to point out the fact that there's a certain measure of self-interest in how they, they advise you. And um, they will rarely encourage you to be generous and help the poor unless there's a tax advantage. Now, speaking of dual relationships and self-interest, can I just point out the elephant in the room? I'm a pastor, and we're talking about tithing and giving and plates being passed and, and whatnot. Uh, that would be the same with Jason, Billy, Trevor, Holly, all the pastors. When we talk about this topic, um, there is a significant measure of self-interest in, in how we, we communicate to you and the motives behind why we're communicating. Um, we just finished remodeling a 100-year-old house. I'm cash poor, and Emory needs new shoes, people. Can we just, can we just pass the plate right now for little Emory, okay? So um, just pointing out the elephant in the room. Uh, Last option, best option. What if we all choose to let God be our financial advisor? Good idea? Okay, there's 2,000 verses in the Bible about money. 50% of the parables that Jesus gave us are about money. Apparently, this is a very important topic to God as it was with his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, more verses in the Bible regarding money than the afterlife. God is the best financial advisor any of us will ever meet. And he cares more about us than our friends, especially our Brooke friends, um, our financial advisors, your pastors, even your family. And he also gives us advice that will serve us well, not only for the 4,000 weeks where we walk on this planet, but for all of eternity. So this is why we need to talk about long speak. Uh, because I'm a pastor and my messages, I like to just shift gears without using a clutch. So let's talk about long speak for a few minutes. Hey, who's climbed long, long speak? Oh, yeah, we got some climbers. They're on that side of the room for some reason. Crossfitters over here, climbers over there. I've noticed this recently. Uh, my, my older son and I, we went fishing this week in Wyoming. He's 30. And when he was nine, we, uh, we climbed uh, Long's Peak, but we didn't quite get to the top. Uh, we, we got through the keyhole. We got to the narrows. And we got to this one sort of sketchy part of the narrows. And he was getting, uh, he was kind of blanching a little bit. I go, okay, it's going to be okay. Then these two guys come along, and they shared the story about how they they heard about a person who died right there where we were standing the, the year before. They told some joke about how he was with his wife and he was, you know, as he was hurling to his death, he was like, honey, I won't be home for dinner as he, as he died at the bottom of the canyon. So um, I, I was like, thanks, you doofuses, for sucking the courage right out of my, my little nine-year-old son. So we didn't make it to the top. It's still on the bucket list. Well, I want to compare the, the journey to the top of Long Speak to the, the generosity journey that God takes all of us on. And uh, I want to do that by, by explaining it in light of seven different stages. Seven stages in the generosity journey. If you have your app, you can follow along in the notes in the app. Stage one is the parking lot. This, this is where people are skeptical. Like, should I really do this or not? Um, when I got to the, the parking lot uh, of Long Peak with my son, it was 2 a.m., and, and he had just finished running a, a 5K in Boulder the night before. I just finished a really, really busy week. And uh, I had all kinds of excuses for not climbing that day and getting out in the dark and the cold and traveling, you know, 7.5 miles and 5,000 feet up in elevation game. Uh, I, I just wasn't feeling it. I was skeptical, to say the least. And, and this is true of a lot of people on the generosity journey. And the, and the question people ask as they're beginning to embark on this journey is, is it going to be worth it? Is, is being generous worth it? And, and people in the skeptic stage of the journey, they ask 
They ask a lot of questions in light of excuses they have for not beginning. Just like you do when your body aches, you don't, don't want to get out of the car in the parking lot at Long Speak. So here's a few. Um, I don't have enough to give. Uh, I already paid too much in taxes. I, I don't trust what they will do with my money. I have kids to take care of. Did I say Emory needs new shoes? And here's my favorite. I love this one. I will be generous after I manifest enough abundance. I love that one. Thanks, Gen, Gen Zers in the crowd. So um, if this is the stage where you currently are, let me ask you uh, two questions that I think will help with that bigger question of, is it going to be worth it? Have you ever met a stingy person who's joyful? I never have. Not once. Have you ever met a generous person who's not joyful? Every generous person I've ever met tends to have a pretty significant level of joy. Generous people are joyful people. I, I think this is why God wants us all to go on this journey together, because he, he longs for us to experience the joy that he experiences, because he's a generous God. And so if you're just beginning the generosity journey, uh, I want to encourage you to claim the promise of Jesus that he gives us in Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. God's, God's promise to you and to me is that, that if we become more generous, we will grow in joy. Do I have a testimony in the room? Anybody? Yeah, got a few. Okay, good. All right, uh, next stage in the journey, this is the trailhead. This is the sometime stage. Okay, people are just starting the, the generosity journeys. They're kind of skeptical. But then there are people who they, they sometimes give. You know, they'll give a little to United Way or they'll give to a year in offering or, you know, just once in a while. And I, I remember seeing the, the Long Speak Trailhead sign briefly as I as I slumbered past it in the dark with my, my headlamp on, and my, my body was rebelling against the journey ahead, and I asked myself the question I think everyone does when they start climbing something, uh, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, is this really, why am I doing this? And uh, people who, who begin the generosity journey, that they ask the question frequently, I think, why should I be generous? And the best answer I know for answering that question is because God is love and God is generous. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. God loves and so God gives. So let's, uh, let's take stock for just a moment of all that God has given us. Okay. Uh, let's start with our lives. I mean, he, he's the creator. If he didn't make us, we wouldn't even exist. How, how's that for a beginning point? We exist because he made us. How generous is that, that we get to live? Number two, our salvation. The scriptures teach we, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is going to get intense. Let me double down. Uh, we, we deserve hell because God's holiness is infinite, and therefore our sin is infinitely offensive to him. We, we deserve hell, but because of Christ, we get heaven. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute. How generous is that? How undeserving are we, and yet how generous is God? We deserve the worst possible outcome because of our sin, but we get the best possible outcome in spite of our sin. Thanks be to Christ Jesus. Amen, somebody? Amen. Every gift we have, a sunny day, food to eat, clean water to drink, a roof over our heads, friends, children, snowbird ski days, the list is endless. It's all ours because God loves and God gives. So when it comes to the generosity journey, we all have a, a choice to make in light of the love and generosity of God. We can be ingrates who choose to live small, selfish, entitled lives and say to hell with God and the needs of others, I'm going to be selfish and live for me. Or we can say, given all God has given me and given how much he loves me, how can I not be as generous and loving as I can possibly be? That, that is the stark choice that everyone faces on the generosity journey. We're in that, they're in that sometimes phase where they give a little bit, but they're not yet like giving on a regular basis. All right, stage three. Um, this is the lower stage of the mountain where you're just kind of, you're cruising along, you know, uh, you're, you're in the middle of the woods. Uh, this is the stewardship stage in the journey. When, when you're on the lower slopes of Long's Peak, uh, you can't help but be struck by just how, how beautiful it is. You know, the woods and, and your, your surroundings. And many feel a sense of gratitude. Don't you know, like when you go hiking and climbing, you're like, oh, this is so amazing. This is so beautiful. And you feel a sense of gratitude. I get to be here right now. This is, this is incredible. 
No, no one ever says when they climb Long's Peak, this is my mountain. I own it. <laughs> There's no sense of entitlement when you're climbing Long's Peak or any significant mountain for, for that matter. I mean, that would be, that'd be ridiculous. And yet when it comes to our money and our, and our stuff, many of us have this, this ridiculous belief that we own it, that it's ours, that we're, in, we're somehow entitled to it. And so to become more generous, we all have to make that, that shift from seeing ourselves as owners to seeing ourselves as managers and investors of what God has given us. So Jesus tells this story. It's, it's fairly well known. Most of you probably know it. Matthew 25. And it's about three guys. And so there's, there's this, this guy that's called a CEO of a company. And he, he's, he's going to go on a trip. And he gives bags of gold to three guys based on their abilities. They don't get the same number of bags. Based on their faithfulness in the past, he gives them some money. And uh, two of the guys, they, they take their bags of gold. They go and invest it. And they, they get 100% return on their investment. And the third guy, he just takes the bag of gold. And he goes and buries it in the backyard. And he gets zero return on his investment. And then the master comes back, and uh, they all give a report. They're accountable for what they did with the money. And the first two guys say, hey, we, we doubled your money. And the, the boss, of course, is super excited, like, wow, way, way to go. And he says to the servants, well done, good and faithful servants. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And they, they go through a party because they invested in NVIDIA or something. You know, like, oh, way to go. And then, then he turns to the, the third guy who buried it in the backyard and he fires the guy, and he never, he never hires him back again. And so here's the main idea of the parable. Uh, we're not owners. Everything we have, it's ultimately God's. Who created all this stuff? Who gave us the abilities we have? Who, who, who made it possible for us to live in the strongest economy in the history of the world? So we're managers and investors. This is important. We will be accountable. We all have a day ahead of us when we're going to give an account for how we use the resources that God entrusted to us. So people at this stage in the generosity journey take what God's entrusted them, and they use it to maximize as much eternal return on investment as they possibly can. And the reward they seek is to one day hear, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Because again, the reason for being generous is joy. All right, you with me? I know I'm going today where angels fear to tread. <laughs> stage four, stage four. The mid-mountain stage. This is the standard stage. So picture you're kind of, you're just getting above tree line, okay? You get, you're about halfway there or so, a little over halfway. And uh, this is where you start asking how questions. Like, like how are my feet? How is my hydration? How much would it cost to get an Uber to take me to the top? <laughs> questions like that. Lots of how questions. Uh, likewise, when people are on a generosity journey with God, they, they start asking the question, how much should I give? Anybody been there? Okay. How much should I give? Kayler, thank you that you answered that question. So <clears throat> this always raises the question of tithing for people who are, are in the scriptures and trying to follow Jesus and the teachings of the scriptures about giving and about money. And, and, and this is a controversial topic. It's controversial among, among Bible scholars. It's controversial among disciples of Jesus. And uh, it, it brings up a lot of shame in people. And that is not the intention of me right now. If you're not giving 10%, hey, no shame, lots of grace. But this always brings up so much shame in people. So we're, we're trying to avoid that today. But we do need to talk about it. So I want to give you just a brief primer on the topic of, of tithing. So first of all, if you're new to the topic, like, hey, I'm... I'm just kicking the tires here. I'm not even following Jesus yet. What are you talking about? A tithe means 10%. In the Bible, tithe means, means 10, 10%. So it's the idea of giving away 10% of your resources to the mission of God and what he cares about in the world. And uh, in the Old Testament, there were three tithes. And so the, the first tithe was uh, for practicing Jews. They would, they would give this tithe to help the Levites and, and all the building campaigns, the synagogues and the temples and to pay all the pastors and stuff like that. Uh, the second 10% was for like this huge annual festival they had. So it was like a party tithe or a vacation tithe. You're like, let's go. And then the last tithe took place every three years, and it was for the poor. And so the average practicing Jew would give 23.5% of their resources away to these three tithes. And uh, more often than not, they're also paying taxes on top of that. But then the New Testament, this is very curious. Jesus, he only mentions the tithe once 
You can find it in Luke and Matthew. It's the same story. So it's one time, but told twice. And, and there he's, he's rebuking some Pharisees because they're really picky about the tithe. They're super legalistic about it. But they're missing more w- other weighty matters of the laws, like taking care of their parents and exercising justice and, and mercy. But, but here's the point. He endorsed it as a spiritual best practice, but he didn't reinforce it as a binding law. Isn't that interesting? What is Jesus up to? Jesus was more interested in us being radically generous and, and listening, listening to God rather than following a law. He wants our giving to be relational. In other words, our giving should be based on an ongoing conversation with the living God. Isn't that beautiful? Not a law, a listening relationship with a living God. And yet, it's important, percentages still matter. Maybe not 10%, but percentages do matter. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So that would be a percentage. Saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So, so Paul is telling apprentices of Jesus in Corinth to set aside a percentage of their income on Sundays, the Lord's Day, the, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, to further the kingdom he brought to earth. And the actual on this is that we're to set aside some percentage of our income based on an ongoing conversation with God every time we get paid so that we can be generous and, and level up to the, the level of generosity God is calling us to. So full disclosure, uh, my wife's right here. So we've been married eight years, and uh, isn't she beautiful, by the way? Come on. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe she married me. Um, so we've been married eight years, and uh, again, full disclosure, we, we've always given between 10% and 46% of our income away. And I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just wanting you to know, I'm not asking you to think about doing anything that we haven't been doing. Okay. And so uh, this year, we're kind of thin. We just, I just said, we, re, we remodeled a house, and so we are cash poor. Did I say Emory needs new shoes? I wasn't kidding. Okay, we, Emory needs new shoes, okay? So this year, we just, we prayed, and we just sensed the Spirit was just saying, hey, back off, and let's get this house done, and we're trying to, you know, plan to have a home for the future. We can exercise hospitality and have our kids uh, have some, you know, their own bedrooms, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but four years ago, when we came out of COVID, uh, we weren't this big, and we were trying to buy this building. It just sort of, like, dropped into our lap. Amazing opportunity, and uh, we did a building initiative. How many of you are here, by the way? Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, we're probably in this building because of you. And so that year, we said, hey, just listen, pray, and if we all give what God tells us to give, we'll have all the resources we need to buy this building and to put a million bucks where it was into fixing it up. And so uh, Chris and I would, would go and pray, and she'd go in one room, and I'd go in the other room, and we'd pray about our mount. And uh, the first time that happened, her mount was a lot more than mine. And you know, being spiritually somewhat prideful, I had to level up to her amount to show I had as much faith as she did. And it was a big gulp. And then uh, we were coming along, you know, meeting our goal almost in the campaign. We, sent, we sensed that God was saying, uh, pray again. And so we did the same thing. All well, this time I went for a long walk and uh, prayed about my amount. I came in, Chris's amount was a lot higher than mine. And so again, had to level up. And so that year, and God just blessed us tremendously that year. And so we were able to give, give a lot more. The, the point I'm making is, this is a year-to-year thing for us. And I hope it will be for you, that we're, we're constantly listening to the Lord. And there are seasons of plenty, and there are seasons of want. And we just got to listen and do what God is calling us to do. But I got to share this passage with you, because I, I've experienced it again and again. And, and so has Carissa. I love this passage. Second Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8. It says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Again, back to that listening relationship with God. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. No pressure, no shame. For God loves a cheerful giver. God gives joyfully, cheerfully. He wants us to be the same way. But I love this verse. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So there... There's two promises in this passage. Number one, you can't outgive God. God's saying, hey, you give, you give, 
you're generous, you sow generously, guess what? I'm going to give you more. I'm going to give you more. And, and the more you give, the more God gives to you. And it's not to increase necessarily your standard of living. I'm going to do a message on that in a few weeks. So, so the, the guys on TV, you know, with the big hair that, that tell you that you should give a lot of money and give it to their ministry and stuff, and they preach what's called the prosperity gospel. Anybody heard of that? The idea behind the prosperity gospel is that this. You give to God, and he'll give back to you to increase your standard of living. What this passage is saying is, no, when you're generous, God will give back to you abundantly so you can increase your standard of giving. It's not that God doesn't care about your standard of living, but he wants you to experience the joy that comes from increasing your standard of giving. And we have experienced that again and again and again. If I had time, I could tell you story after story, crazy stories of how God has blessed us and how we got windfalls and stuff. It's just it's so cool to watch God like, answer this promise. You can never outgive God, ever. And the more you give, the more he's going to give to you so you can have an abundance to continue and do every good work he calls you to be a part of. Is that cool? Isn't that good? I, sidebar, I get passionate about this topic. Most pastors hate talking about money. The reason I love talking about money so much is because God has used it as a tool in my life again and again and again to grow my faith and to help me experience his goodness. And I want that for every single one of you today. All right, stage five, the keyhole, the, the strategic stage in the journey up the mountain, Long's Peak, as well as the generosity journey. Um, once you get to the boulder field, if you've been there and you go, you go through this thing called the keyhole, that right there, uh, then you've got the narrows, the trough, and the home stretch. In, in other words, it's, it's time for some strategic thinking because things are about to get a little sketchier, okay? And so people in the generosity journey uh, as they're ascending in the journey, this is the stage where they ask strategic questions. And one of the primary strategic questions is this, where should I give? Where should I give my resources? And according to the Bible, there's two very simple answers. Number one is the lost, the spiritually lost, those who've yet to hear the good news of Jesus. So Philippians 4, 15 and 18 says this, Paul speaking, he says, moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Paul's a little bitter here. <laughs> he's planted some churches. He's helped these people find Jesus, and they're not giving to his ministry to further the work. No, been there. Uh, I planted four churches. I've been there, Paul. I feel your pain, buddy. Okay, um, then he says in verse 18, I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are fragrant, offering, and acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So he's, this is his thank you note. He's saying, hey, thank you for not being like those other churches. Thank you for being a generous church. And thank you for funding all my travels and all my training events, all the things I got to do to continue to see the gospel spread and reach people who've never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And then he ends in verse 19 by giving them the promise we read in 2 Corinthians 9, my God will, will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, hey, the money you gave to me, God's going to restore it so you can continue to be generous towards the mission of God. Here's the, here's the main idea. God's mission requires money. God's mission requires money. That's why we're doing this year in offering. That's why we give away so much money because it takes money to do mission. Every significant vision from God requires some measure of provision. Which is the reason I love this church so much. I, I, I mean, let's put percentages to this. Last year, you guys gave away 39% of the revenue, or we gave away the 39% of the revenue you guys gave us to reaching and discipling people around the world outside of our walls. 39%. Is that amazing? That's definitely clappable. So the first place God wants us to give is reaching the lost. It's, it's the great commission of Jesus. Go make disciples of all nation, nations, of all people groups. The second strategic place is the poor. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, again, Paul's speaking. He says, when James and Cephas and John, Peter, James, and John, the top three most preeminent disciples, who seem to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me. Paul was kind of a Johnny come lately when it came to being an apostle, and he was a persecutor of Christians. He says, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And so he's referring to the fact that they were called to go reach the Jews with the good news, and, and Paul and Barnabas and others 
we're called to go and reach the Gentiles, not Jews. Ends with this. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So Paul's describing how these, these 12 apostles embraced him as a fellow apostle. They, they sent him out to the Gentiles, and they said, yeah, keep doing what you've been doing. Keep making disciples for Jesus. Keep sharing the good news and filling people's hearts with the love of God and the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and giving them the hope of eternity and establishing the kingdom of God on earth. But don't forget the poor. And he goes, glad they told me that. They had me at hello. So we're all called to spread the good news and we're called to do good deeds. We're called to help the poor. So I don't know if you heard last week, I was gone last week, but I had a video where I described how in South Asia, how in our movement there, we're helping widows uh, start businesses. It's not a death sentence if you are a widow over there, but it's really bad. And so we're helping widows create self-sustaining businesses, and every time we help a Christian widow, we help a non-Christian widow. That's kind of how we play. We match them dollar for dollar, so that the Christians over there are also giving, they're sharing with us in the joy of generosity. Uh, we also support a, a full-time missionary who works daily on Colfax. He calls it the Boulevard of Hope. He, he has a vision for Colfax I certainly don't have. And he and I were texting this, this week, and it's cold, and there's just a lot of pain on Colfax. And so he serves the homeless and, and those with mental health issues every single day. Why? Because God cares for the poor. And I know poor is not like a politically correct thing to say, but that's what the Bible calls them, so I'm going to call them that. And, and many of us, we have compassion children that we sponsor, and we want to do that in partnership with local churches all over the world because God cares for the poor. So if you want to be strategic in your giving, focus your dollars primarily on reaching the lost and helping the poor. Amen? Okay. All right. Two more stages. Final approach. Uh, this is the succession stage in the journey. So on, on Long's Peak, um, the, the final approach is called, called the home stretch. It's where things get a little hand over hand, and, uh, and then you get to the top. On, on the generosity journey, the home stretch is where people ask the question, what should I do with my money after I die? Proverbs 13.22 says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. So when we die, we're to leave an inheritance for our children and our grandchildren. Proverbs is not a bunch of promises. It's a bunch of best practices. That's a good practice. Leave a little bit of money for your kids, maybe even your grandkids. But, but it's more than just money. I mean, it should include some amount of money if you can, but it also includes things like faith in God. The inheritance we want to pass on is faith in God. It includes character, wisdom, uh, hopefully a God-honoring marriage, and, and a legacy of making disciples and being generous. These are, these are the things we want to pass on as our legacy to our, our, our children. Uh, when I was in my 30s, I, I moved here from California, and I, I planted a church downtown Denver, and I, I, uh, most of my friends were still in California, and I didn't want to lose them as friends. And so every year, I'd have some of my friends come out, and we'd spend a weekend together in Colorado Springs. And... Uh, most of these guys, were, they were all business guys. I was like the token pastor. And, and they, they had other business friends. And all of a sudden, I started noticing the demographic of this particular group of guys. And if I told you their names, you would know some of these guys. Like some of these guys have a legacy of family, money. And they have some famous names, like even the names of certain presidents. I can't give it away. But I wish I could. But anyway, I, I started looking at these guys, and I started affectionately calling them the Lucky Sperm Club. I said, you guys, you guys are just the right egg and the right sperm at the right time and the right family, and you're just like on a trajectory of exponential wealth, uh, a journey I was not on and have not ever been on. Okay? But every year, we'd bring in a, a mentor to teach us, somebody who was 10, 20, 30 years older, and we'd ask them questions, and they'd share their testimony about their journey spiritually. And, and one year, we had Al McDonald come in. At that point in time, he was the CEO of McKinsey Consulting, which is one of the most prestigious consulting firms in the world. And uh, he had become a follower of Jesus, like, I think, like, 10 years earlier. And so he had this very dynamic testimony. He, he was broken and came to faith through brokenness. And we started peppering him with all kinds of questions. And one of the questions somebody asked is, how much money should we leave for our children? And he began to recall all these stories of very wealthy people who have ruined their kids and ruined their families by giving away too much money and entitling them and robbing them of the opportunity to provide for themselves. And so here was his advice to us. He said, 
help a little bit with college. He goes, I don't even recommend paying for all the college. Make them work a little bit. And then uh, he goes, maybe, maybe a down payment on a house, a little bit for that. And then have like an emergency fund in case something bad happens and keep it you know, somewhere and then give it away if they don't need it. And he said, other than that, I wouldn't do more than that. He said, just give it away. Put it in a DAF, put it in a foundation, do something, but give it most of it away. And, and if you can have your kids be a part of the giving away of that money after you pass away, that's even better. Because then you're passing on a, a legacy of generosity. I think that's brilliant advice from a man who's seen what wealth can do when it's used properly or improperly as an inheritance. So if you're in that stage, I, w- I want to encourage you to ask some important questions. Uh, one question would be, how can you bless your kids without enabling or entitling them when you die? Number, and I know there's like, what, six of us that are even thinking about this right now, but you will someday. Um, <laughs> Number two, how can you pass on a legacy of generosity to your kids? That's super important. And then number three, how can you invest your wealth in the mission of God so it builds the kingdom long after you die? And if you're asking those questions, just know I'm asking those questions too. I'm 61. We have a, a will and a trust. We're going to redo it probably this next year, 2025. If you want to sit down, have some coffee, and talk that through, I'd love to be a part of that conversation with you. I'm sure we can gain wisdom from each other. All right. You guys ready? We're almost to the summit. You ready for the summit? Stage seven. Here we go. Boom. Man, what a great view. Okay. 50% of those who hike Long's Peak make it to the top each year. But what an awesome feeling and experience for those who do. I wouldn't know personally. didn't make it. Thanks to those two doofuses that freaked out my son. But, but maybe someday I'll, I'll experience that myself. And regarding the generosity journey, uh, I, I have no idea... How many people reach the summit? But I'm hopeful, and I'm, I've been praying this week that all of us will get there together. Uh, people at this stage in the journey, if they've been faithful in their generosity, they don't ask questions anymore. Looking into the face of Jesus, they have all they need. No more questions. And then hearing their Heavenly Father say to them, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Those words erase all their questions, all their doubts, all their fears. And that becomes, for them, the defining moment of their lives. That's the apex. So to increase our odds of reaching the summit of this journey, um, let's review and listen to God for a few minutes. Because if all you do is listen to this message, you go, that was kind of interesting, but you do nothing, you're going to miss out. And so I want to review this, this taxonomy of generosity with you. Just go over the journey briefly. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to index yourself with where you currently are in the journey and then listen and ask God, where do you want me to go next? Are you asking me to level up today and go to the next stage? Okay? So here, here we have it. We've got the skeptic stage on the parking lot. We're climbing, we're climbing, we're climbing. Here's stage seven. There's the summit. So let's review and let's get in a posture of listening and surrender and let's respond to however God is speaking to us today. So if you're in the the parking lot, the skeptic stage, what would it look like for you to become a sometimes giver? To to get past your excuses and just begin to sometimes give something to somebody. I mean, maybe today you go and you buy some McDonald's gift cards, five bucks a piece. You you put them in your car. And when you're at that stoplight and there's the homeless person or the immigrant or the refugee and you're awkward and you're trying to look forward as they're looking at you, you know, and you're like, oh, gosh, this is so... And comfortable, you roll the window down and you hand them a card or two so they can buy some coffee and a hamburger and you bless them in Jesus' name. Okay. What, what if you put some extra money like in it somewhere, your purse, your billfold, and every once in a while you go, you know what, I'm just going to pay for the coffee for the person behind me in line at your favorite coffee store. You, you just become a sometimes giver. Take a step past your skepticism today. Now, maybe you're at the, the trailhead, and you already are a sometimes giver. Every once in a while, you, you throw money in an offering, or you help somebody here or there. Now, what if today, 
This is a critical inflection point in the journey, by the way. What if today you surrender your stuff to God and, and you just pray and you say, God, everything I have is yours. Forgive me for thinking I'm the owner. How ridiculous is that? I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Everything I have, putting it all on the table, it's all yours. What do you want me to do with your stuff? Stage three, the lower trail part of the stage, the stewardship stage. You, you've been a steward for a while. You, you've recognized God is the owner of, of all that you have. But when was the last time you asked God what your standard of giving should be? We're all pretty good about the standard of living question. But it's easy just to kind of go, oh, I'm going to give that, and we just lock in for a long time. What if today you listen and go, God, I'm giving, I think about this percentage. I mean, increase that? Is it time to increase, decrease? What, what is the standard of giving that you want me to be at right now, today? And you go home and you make adjustments. Uh, four, mid-mountain standard stage. You, you've set some giving standards. You know, you've thought prayerfully, listened to God about percentages, and now it's time to become more strategic. Um, are you giving to the things God cares about the most? Are most of your dollars going to helping the lost be reached and enter into the kingdom of God and helping the poor? Ask God today, how can I be more strategic in my giving? Uh, base camp, strategic stage. You've been giving strategically to the things that are on God's heart, but, but what about after you die? Are, are you ready for the succession stage as you, as you move towards the peak of the mountain? That day when you stand before the Lord and give account for your resources. So what if you ask God today to, to begin to give you wisdom about the inheritance you leave behind for, for your kids and for your grandkids? Six, succession stage, keep going. Some of you are there right now, and you're doing a great job. And we're cheering you on all the way to the finish line. We will continue to cheer you on. Cross the finish line with nothing left and your clip empty. <laughs> Go all in until you cross that line, okay? We'll keep cheering you on. Summit stage, on the day of reckoning, I pray we all hear God say to each of us, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. May we all hear that come out of our maker's lips on the day we stand before him. So as the keys are playing, let's take a few moments. Let's just, let's bow and let's, let's listen to what the Spirit's saying to us. Take a moment and just be honest. Live in the light before the Holy Spirit and index yourself. Where are you in the journey? And then where is God asking you to go next in faith? What stage are you at? What stage is he calling you to? And as you do this, remember that of all the people who give you financial advice, God is the best financial advisor you will ever meet. He has your best interest in mind. He will take care of you. After you finish indexing yourself in the journey, ask God for one concrete step you can take to become more generous and obey his, his will. Father, we thank you for being so radically, radically generous with, with each and every one of us. And we thank, your, thank you that you're good. And whatever you're calling us to is because you're good and you want to be good to us. So help us step out in faith today and take whatever steps you're asking us to take in faith, knowing that you want us to experience the joy of generosity and become more like you. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, guess what? We're taking up an offering. Uh, Emery needs new shoes. Uh, no, at this time, if the, if the ushers would come forward, and uh, there's lots of ways you can give here. You can give to the, in the baskets. You can give uh, online through the app. So give however you feel led. 
But as we're passing the offering right now, uh, we have a great video of a couple in our church, Addison and Maggie, and they're sharing with us in this video a little bit about their, their generosity journey. When it comes to finances and generosity, I find it helpful for myself to reframe it from giving and more towards returning. Uh, specifically when it comes to um, uh, the money that God has given us to steward, I view it less about this is my money, how can I, uh, what can I do with it, but more so this is God's money he's entrusted, uh, entrusted me and my wife with, how are we going to steward that for the kingdom? And uh, it's so easy to look around the world and say, yeah, 10% is a lot. There's a lot of things that can be done with, with those funds, but I like to view it as I'd rather trust God in charge of 90% than me in charge of 100%. And I've just found that when it comes to the best return on investment uh, of the resources God has given me, there's nothing greater than what the kingdom can offer. Investing in the kingdom is the best opportunity for me and my wife for us to give of our funds and see how God's going to be glorified and how God's going to use it. One of my favorite verses is uh, Matthew 13, 44, and specifically talks about how there's a man who is in a field and, he, and he's basically stumbled across a treasure. Um, and then when he found it, saw how valuable it was, he covered it back up, ran home, and in his joy sold all that he had and bought the field. I love this parable because Jesus says that's the kingdom of heaven. He describes this kind of shady guy who uh, comes across something, realizes this is so valuable that if I were to sell everything, I'd still be a bargain to get what this has. Uh, no matter if we were to give everything that we had, it still would pale in comparison to the value of the kingdom. So my wife and I, in our budget, we carve out every month, not just money we're gonna give for our tithe, but money we're gonna to give to designated causes. And also we wanna have some flexibility for when things come up that we can um, be generous and we can provide those funds uh, in need uh, so that God can, uh, God can move in miraculous ways however he chooses to do so. We thank those guys for sharing their story. <laughs> This is our opportunity right now as we come to the communion table to express our gratitude to God for being so generous to us that he gave us what was most valuable to him, and that was his son, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed, broke bread and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. Communion service would please come forward. On that same evening, he poured wine. He said, this wine represents the blood of a new covenant kind of love and, and grace and forgiveness. And then he told us to do this until he returns. So here at Restoration, we take a piece of bread, we dip it into the juice. If you guys would stand, let's, let's worship. Let's thank God for being so radically generous to us. Love you guys. Thank you for being a great church.